closed captioning of this program is made possible by the Fireman's Fund Foundation. This week, the historic federal trial over the constitutionality of California's gay marriage ban wraps up with closing arguments. Uncovering the health hazards of methyl iodide, a pesticide used in growing strawberries. A review by UC Berkeley of its response to last year's student protest against fee hikes reveals mistakes by campus police and university leaders. Also, a conversation with author Gail Sheehy about the difficult demands on caregivers. Coming up next. Good evening, I'm Belva Davis and welcome to This Week in Northern California. Joining me on our news panel tonight, Nanette Asimov, staff writer with the San Francisco Chronicle, on UC Berkeley's review of its response to last year's student protests. Amy Stanton, reporter for KQED's Quest series on the danger of methyl iodide used in growing strawberries. And starting with Jess, Jesse McKinley, who is the San Francisco bureau chief for the New York Times. You covered the trial where Judge uh, Vaughn uh, asked them, Vaughn Walker, asked the two sides to submit answers to questions that he'd given them some time in advance. Was that an unusual thing? It was something of an unusual step. I mean, what was interesting about it was that the common refrain, the word that you saw again and again and again in these questions was evidence. Uh, what Walker was hunting for and what he wanted in this entire trial, which took, you know, over five months, uh, what he wanted was hard evidence. He wanted data, he wanted numbers, he wanted show of, of, of economic harm. And so this is something that he came back to again and again in these questions. And it was not a small number of questions. It was 37 in total. So they really had their work cut out for him. Mm. What, does either side seem better prepared than the other in addressing those? But they didn't get the same questions. No, did they? there was there was a roster of similar questions, and they each had a dozen each. It was like an episode of Jeopardy or something. But they, um, they, it seemed to me, at least in the courtroom, what was uh, these questions were mainly set up to establish kind of a framework for their closing arguments. Mm -hmm. And in the courtroom on Wednesday. It seemed fairly clear to me that uh, the defense was really on the defense. I mean, there were a lot of very pointed questions about why they hadn't called more witnesses, why they hadn't brought up more evidence. Um, so if I was a betting man, I would say that the de defense was, was really on their heels. Mm. From what I've heard, I mean, it sounds like Judge Walker was really pretty critical of the defense's arguments. And I'm wondering, were there, you know, if you had to pick an argument that seemed to hold up the best, the strongest, under that criticism, what was it? What, what seems to be their strongest card at this point? Well, it's, uh, that's, that's a good question because Walker seemed really dismissive of, of, of most of their arguments. And the central tenet of what they were trying to say was, look, uh, the, the institution of marriage is about one thing. It's about making babies. That's, what, that's all they seem to want to say. And they said that again and again and again. They said it during the trial and they said it in their closing. And Walker, without p pausing, was like, that makes no sense whatsoever. Basically said, what about people that are infertile? What about people that are past the age where they can have children? So in terms of the defense, if that was the card they were betting on, it's kind of a weak card. But Jesse, forgive me for leaping ahead here, but isn't this really ultimately going to wind up in the US Supreme Court? And is it going to hinge on what one swing vote say Anthony Kennedy thinks about all of this, yeah, not I mean, necessarily talking, Von Walker. In talking to Ted Olson, who is a smart guy and is new to the issue of same-sex marriage, but obviously spent a little time in front of the Supreme Court, you know, you ask him, you say, look, right now the composition of the Supreme Court, it leans slightly to the right, um, probably 5-4. He is very confident that he has that fifth vote. And mm -hmm. you mentioned Judge Kennedy. I think that that is the one they are counting on that. He has in the past sided with the liberal side on cases involving gay rights. Um, that being said, this is going to take a while. Um, I think Walker will probably give his decision eh, within, by the end of the summer. It will be instantaneously appealed. Mm -hmm. It will go to the Ninth Circuit. It may go directly to the Supreme Court. Are we but, talking years? 
I think it's going to be a couple of years. Yes. I mean, it, he, he took four months, though, you know, from the time that the trial yeah. uh, testimony ended uh, to get to this point of hearing closing arguments. What, what? That's, is that on you? I think that was purposeful. I think that this is such a closely watched case. I think that so many, uh, you know, so many couples are hinging on this. It's being, it's being covered nationally, obviously. Uh, that he wants to be extremely deliberate about his decision. He wants this decision to be every, every I dotted, every T crossed. And I think that that was part of it. it you know, he had the two and a half week trial, and they said, you know what? Let's take a little while, and I'm going to think about these issues. He asked for briefs once. He asked for briefs again. He asked. He put out these questions that you mentioned. He wants to be extremely precise when he gives this decision because he knows it's going to be parsed extremely closely. Mm -hmm. And is this, um, what's at stake here? I mean, ultimately, if this does wind its way all the way up, is it going to wipe same-sex marriage off and make it, you know, if, they, if the ruling goes against same-sex marriage and make it impossible for any of the states that do it to continue? Well, there's an interesting irony here. If, let's say, it does get to the Supreme Court, and let's say the Supreme Court says, you know what, the state of California is completely within their rights to set their own laws, and they reject uh, any challenge to Proposition 8. Then, conceivably, if they were to take this to a vote, say in 2012, another vote on same-sex marriage, mm -hmm. and it were to pass, the precedent would have been set already that the states can make their own laws. So, mm -hmm. in a weird way, it could actually work to their advantage. Well, any true. any word for that? I think 19,000 or so, 18,000 people who were married during that one period when that was possible. Uh, did he indicate uh, at all of what might happen? Well, or? he made a point. Uh, there had been a brief issued by the defense the morning of the the uh, closing arguments, where there seemed to be some suggestion that they were going to have Proposition 8 re be become retroactive. And this sent out this huge hue and cry in the, in the gay rights community that somehow they were trying to invalidate the 18,000 people who were married between May and November of 2008. Uh, so Judge Walker asked that question. He said, are you trying to have this, uh, these marriages invalidated? And the defense was very careful to say, no, 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 we absolutely do not have that opinion. So it's, it's unclear as to whether or not that was the intention, but right now those people seem safe. Mm -hmm. Well, we, you've been following a case, of course, as we said, that has drawn national attention in the courts, but uh, Amy, you've been working on a case that's just rising to the top of concerns, and uh, yours is a strawberry story. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> and I want to say right <laughs> off the top, this is not about strawberries not, that yes. are in the supermarkets right, right now. This is the first question everyone asks. Does this mean I should not eat strawberries anymore? And this, the concern with this particular chemical, it's called methyl iodide, is really for it's about farm workers, um, not just about farm workers, it's also about people who live near strawberry fields. And in California, that's a lot of people. Um, strawberries are grown on the coast, people tend to live on the coast, you have all kinds of communities and schools and daycare centers that are right up against strawberry fields in towns like Monterey, Salinas, Watsonville. Um, so yes, this is a concern for those people's health. Well, strawberries are so plentiful, and they're yeah. more so so much more reasonably priced. It seems as though this season than we've yes. seen larger, bigger. Uh, is that because of what? I mean, well, I think that's probably because it's, this has been a good year for growing strawberries. I mean, strawberries—the way strawberries are grown right now—is the way they have been grown for decades, and that's I'm talking about conventional strawberries. That's grown using a fumigant. Um, it's a chemical called methyl bromide, and basically, this is something that farmers use to sterilize their soil before they put the strawberry plants in. Um, and what it does is it wipes out all the pests, so that you put your plant in and you have a plant that is not competing with any bugs or mold or anything like that. You get twice as many strawberries if you use a fumigant. The problem is that methyl bromide damages the ozone layer and was essentially banned about 10 years ago. And it's taken strawberry growers that long to come up with an alternative. Uh, it's a $2 billion industry, and they say, we can't do it without this chemical, methyl iodide. The but alternative, <laughs> yes, exactly. Will do what? To That's the I huge mean, sort of butt of this story. On the one hand, you have a chemical that causes <clears throat> significant damage to the environment, the ozone layer. On the other hand, you have a chemical that is highly toxic. One of the scientists who consulted on this decision, who worked for the state, called it one of the most dangerous chemicals in the world. I mean, they, you know, very strong language you hear from Nobel prize winning scientists um, on the toxicity of this chemical. So it's environment, farm workers' Global, health. global exactly. warming versus cancer, basically, is what More we're talking. Less, yeah. <laughs> yeah. When, when would this yeah. take effect? When, would, uh, when, when should I stop eating strawberries, really? Well, <clears throat> you know, it, this all depends. I mean, we're back to lawsuits, really, right? yeah. you know, like, like your story. I mean, the next, we're in right now the public comment period. So 
by June 29th, you and anyone else can write a letter to the State Department of Pesticide Regulations saying, you know, don't use this chemical. Um, after that, it's up to the that agency to decide what, what to do with those comments. You know, no one's saying that this is a done deal, but the agency has never reversed itself before. <laughs> they have never said they're going to approve something and then not approved it. Okay. So, but I think there's a, a lot of talk about lawsuits coming from environmental groups. And where do right. the farmers come down? Uh, the farmers say they need the chemical. Yeah. Um, I mean, well, you know, are you talking about farm workers or are you talking about farm owners? Farm I mean, owners, that's a big, yeah. the farm owners would say, we don't have a business if not for this chemical. It would take years to switch over to organic. It would mean the entire country would be spending $6 a basket. Talk a little bit more about the, 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 the pesticide we're talking about. Sure, okay, so methyl iodide is, um, like I said, it's a fumigant, so you inject it into the soil. It's very toxic. It's a carcinogen, like Jesse said, which means it causes thyroid tumors. It also causes uh, miscarriages. These are in animal studies on rats and rabbits. Um, it is also a neurotoxin, and the science on that is much more is sort of still still taking place. The great fear is that if you have a chemical that causes miscarriages, so affects the fetus, mm. and causes brain damage, surely there's a lot you're doing to that fetus before it actually dies. Um, this is it's grim stuff, but we're talking about changes in the developing brain that might take decades to be detected. Um, and that's, that's. And you, have, it's, you it's, don't know when it, we will know. There was a hearing on Thursday. There's a but hearing on done. Thursday. We don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, we know what did happen in Berkeley in November. <laughs> yes, and that was that students were upset about an increase in fees that was proposed. And they, they let the authorities know that. And that didn't go so well. Boy, did they let them know. Mm -hmm. um, November 20th was a, very, it was a pivotal day in the UC Berkeley and UC uh, year of protests. It was um, the day after the UC Regents approved um, a really an unprecedented 32% fee hike, bringing fees over 10,000, basic fees over $10,000 for the first time. But November 20th was not the first day of protest. Students had been protesting up and down the state on campuses since September. And there were a lot of clues that the day after this uh, regents vote, there would be trouble. What um, we have uh, that just came out is a rather extraordinary look back at the university's response, administrators and police leaders, and how they handled that day of protests and in a very eloquent 128 pages the uh, independent review said they did a horrible job mm -hmm. that's the and, leaderships and what, what they did why I mean, did they give a reason did they they uh, skewered really the police and the administration for not taking seriously the threat of uh, what, what happened on November 20th was that about 40 students took over a, a Wheeler Hall on the UC Berkeley campus. They barricaded themselves in and they opened the windows and they spoke to a crowd of about 2,000 students who ringed that building and they said, you know, we will not, this is our university, we're taking it over. And the police and the administration were shouldn't have been, but were caught by surprise. And they focused on those 40 students up there and forgot that there were 2,000 angry um, students in the rain, may I add, um, who were just as furious and angry as the people inside the building. And the police, the campus police were uh, un, there were too few of them. There was no real uh, administration in charge. I think in the morning they were having breakfast somewhere. Um, and this report looks back and says, all right, you know, the, the, these are the mistakes that were made. Well, I just brought this along because I, I thought it was rather interesting. Mm -hmm. About 40 years ago, a little more than that, the Berkeley campus was like the epicenter of student protests. And looking at a couple of headlines from the <laughs> Daily Cal back, I guess that was about 1969. Uh, and uh, at that, on that particular day, 35 people were shot at Berkeley. Preceding that, the shot you saw was of a helicopter spewing tear gas. I mean, this is a school that's gone mm -hmm. through it all and should know well how to handle student yeah. uprisings. You could say that the educators, the instructors didn't do their homework, you could say. But um, this was the, the birthplace of the free speech movement. Um, 
there wasn't as much violence on November 20th, uh, although it was a it was described in the report as a dangerous confrontation. The um, police used batons and barricade metal barricades, and they whacked students' uh, wrists, and and somebody broke their fingers. A police officer was uh, out of work for months after a barricade came down on him. And so, if you have this kind of history then you really need to prepare. What if we have civil disobedience of this size? What if we have it of this size and nobody had done so? Now, there were protests in March over education cuts as well. Was there any indication that the, the UC had learned lessons out of this, that they, that they were not caught by surprise in March? I think they didn't need this 128 page report to realize that they needed to do something different. So by the time spring came around, and there were a number of other protests, including a recent hunger strike, the um, administration, Chancellor Robert Bergenau, mm -hmm. had realized he needed to talk to the students a little bit more and set things in motion. And, and things are in motion because there was another pay increase. Yes. <laughs> not a pay increase, I'm sorry, a, another hike fee in increase. fees. Yes. Not at UC, yeah. but at CSU, 5% today. All right. Thanks to all of you for joining us tonight with very interesting stories. And now some other stories from the news this week. The San Francisco Board of Supervisors voted in favor of requiring retailers to post radiation levels emitted by cell phones. If approved, the law would be the first in the nation. Mayor Newsom says that he will sign it. It is opposed by sellers and critics who say there is no conclusive evidence of a health risk. It was no surprise, lawmakers in Sacramento missed the June 15th deadline for a new budget. They are preparing for a long summer battle over spending cuts in social programs proposed by the governor and tax increases and elimination of corporate tax breaks proposed by Democrats. Economic reports released this week show that while the worst may be over, the state's recovery will be slow. According to the latest UCLA Anderson forecast, California's unemployment rate will remain high, averaging 12 percent this year, despite growth in export and technology-related manufacturing. The U.S. Supreme Court will consider whether a federal court panel overstepped its authority when it ordered California to reduce its prison population by about 40,000 to improve inmate health care. And farmers west of the Sacramento and San Joaquin Delta celebrated their new federal water allotment increases from 5 percent to 45 percent. Millions of Americans care for a loved one struggling with illness, disability, or conditions related to aging. In her latest book, Passages in Caregiving, Turning Chaos into Confidence, best-selling author Gail Sheehy shares her personal account of caring for her husband for 17 years when he was diagnosed with cancer and offers practical guidance for caregivers. We spoke earlier. Gail Sheehy, thank you so much for joining us on the program. You know, Bill Moyer and most of the people, public television viewers, respect that word, said of your new book uh, for, about caregiving that, trust me, there is no better guide to caregiving. That's pretty high praise. Always the book is uh, Passages in Caregiving. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you started on that journey of wanting to write such a definitive book. Well, that came much later. My journey was becoming a caregiver, not being prepared, having no idea, not being trained. Like most family caregivers, there are 50 million of us taking care of adults who used to be independent. And, you know, you're probably entered your second adulthood, mid 40s, 50, and you're really excited about doing new things, finding new passions, simulating old ones. Suddenly you get the call. Mm -hmm. And with, with, for me, it was a call about from my husband's oncologist, I was in a beauty shop getting ready to go to a concert with him, saying, it's not benign. What? The cyst that we took out on Mr. Felker's neck, you know, two years ago, the pathologist recut the old slides. It's cancer. It's cancer. You know, my husband has cancer, and we have to suddenly jump into shock and mobilization, and, you know, our lives change. and. It took months for me to realize that I had a new role, too. Now I was something they call a family caregiver. Mm -hmm. And most of us, 
don't even recognize that. It's a professional level role, and it can go on for years, as it did in my case, for 17 years off and on. Tell us a bit about your husband. He was a special person, too, so yes, that he required, he had, a, he had a community of people that were. Well, we had a circle of care, which I say is essential. Nobody can do the caregiving role alone. It's impossible, you'll burn out. His colleagues actually circled around, secretly looked at universities and colleges where he might get back into action again to give him a purpose after the, the first uh, operation and treatment. And they found Berkeley was interested. And so Clay, Clay Felker, who had a reputation as being a um, magazine genius, um, came out to Berkeley. Founded we changed our lives. He founded New York Magazine. Mm -hmm. um, this was on the second diagnosis of cancer. And the doctor said, do something wonderful the two of you together that you wouldn't have done but without this crisis. I'm not even going to treat you. So we worked on that. We worked on it for a year and tore up our lives in publishing in New York and moved out here to the Bay Area to Berkeley. Clay began, you know, putting on his lens and professor's clothes every morning and driving over to the J School and giving a new um, generation of journalists the, the excitement about magazines and making magazines with them. It was marvelous. It, it, we had a six-year reprieve. Um, and I think that doing something risky and exciting and dramatic with your life is a, is a, can be a wonderful antidote to illness. But then came the tougher times. Well, that was six years. Then he had a, a, a recurrence. Uh, that was, you know, s nine years after the first cancer, uh, and that was a rough one to uh, to deal with. Because, but by then we were far enough around the labyrinth of caregiving, which is my metaphor for walking the labyrinth, the circles of caregiving that we knew how to deal with it better. And we knew not to take the first diagnosis. And the, we had a doctor who was very um, dictatorial and said, no, you have to have surgery and they'll probably have to remove the voice box because it, even if it isn't involved with the cancer. Well, my husband without a voice, impossible. So we went, found friends who recommended us to another doctor and found another a whole different treatment that, that saved his voice. How do you get the will, the power the permission to take over your own life or the life of the person who you care about. Well, that's the, the really the essence of the book is it has to be a collaboration between the patient, the caregiver, and the physician, the social worker, the nurse, the other people who are on the team. Uh, and when you respect yourself as being, uh, you know, really the person who pulls it all together, then you can communicate that to the health professionals and they will respect you and work with you. If they won't, you have to move on. Is there a new recognition of the contribution that caregivers make, not just to their families, but to our to whole society. society? Yeah. Well, you know, we are the, <laughs> we are what keeps the, the broken healthcare system together. You know, we, the whole in-between stage when people can't be cured in a, in a acute care hospital anymore, but they aren't ready for hospice, which requires that you be ready to die within six months. That in-between stage can last for years. And the patient is released from the hospital or, or aftercare home to somebody who isn't trained and who probably needs to continue working to support him or herself for the future. Uh, there's just beginnings of community care. And the best community care is the whole idea of the, the village movement, which is really taking hold here in the San Francisco area, I'm so happy to say. The San Francisco village uh, is a way of people coming together in kind of the commune spirit of the 60s and helping each other to live gracefully and productively in their own homes and apartments till the end of their lives by sharing uh, services that they get at a discount. It could be a computer tutor or somebody volunteers to walk the dog or water the plants if you're in the hospital, uh, but also to share cultural, political, social life together and really be a community. Are you uh, encouraged by the new health care legislation that have passed the Congress that there will be more help for those who are keeping many people out of hospitals and out of care institutions by being a, a caregivers? Anything in it for them? There is a tiny thing that's going to take five, six years to vest, um, but there is, for the first time, government long-term care insurance that employers can offer to their employees for a small amount each month, just like Social Security, and then when it's vested after five years, you can take advantage of it at any time that you need home care. And you can get $75 a day to pay a family member or somebody to help you. But that isn't going to actually happen until five or six years. 
because there, there's a vesting period. But that's a beginning. So in the meantime, you offer in your book many strategies for getting along. For getting, for calling your area agency on aging to find out what the community uh, resources are. They're in the book. The telephone numbers are in the book. Uh, looking into an elder care manager who can help you to assemble people that you need and, and walk you through all the crazy rules and regulations so you know how to get your loved one on Medicaid or how to take advantage of Medicare waiver programs that might give people to you to help. Um, it's strategies for taking care of somebody with Alzheimer's, for dealing with the unloved one. You know, everybody isn't just buddy-buddy with their parents. And especially how to have the meeting with your brothers and sisters before the crisis to talk about what each of you could contribute to keep mom and dad at home as long as they can. Well, we've only talked a few minutes about a book that's worth a million bucks for somebody who's had to walk the path you're talking about. Uh, and because there are websites in there, there are telephone numbers there and there are things. Local to, and national resources and right, hotlines. Right, So, yeah. Gail Sheehy, Passages in Caregiving, we thank you so much. Thanks, Belva. Mm -hmm. Well, next week, a sneak peek at the Fisher Collection at San Francisco's MoMA. Father of Biodiversity, E.O. Wilson, and Food and Wine This Week. Visit kqed.org slash this week to watch complete episodes and segments of our program. Subscribe to our newsletter and podcast and share your thoughts about the show. I'm Belva Davis. Good night.